Mein Name ist Lena Tangens vom Föhrgut aus Bielefeld. Ich werde heute eine super kurze Einführung darin geben, wie RFID überhaupt zum Thema wurde im Kontext von Datenschutz. Und danach werden wir Andreas Krisch hören, der dann die Folgen im europäischen Kontext äh, und äh, nicht nur in Bezug auf RFID, sondern vielleicht auch die weiterführenden. So the continuation into the EU Data Protection Directive that might be. And then there'll be a Q&A. All right. Fürbord has been existing since 1987 and since 2000 we are bestowing the Big Brother Awards, a negative award about data protection. And by the way, until the end of this year, until the 31st, you can nominate for the next German Big Brother Awards. The Big Brother Awards have actually put RFID on the agenda and that was in 2003. When the future store near Duisburg, New Duisburg, it's a, a supermarket, a fairly regular supermarket that was using RFID in the wild for the first time. It belongs to a metro, a large supermarket chain, and we were bestowing that award in a preventative way. There was no concrete data violation at the time, but we thought this technology has so much potential about data protection, violation, tracking, that we will bestow this award in a preventative way. So this was the first time we managed to get some attention for this topic. In February 2004, we organized a talk in Bielefeld with the American consumer activist Catherine Albrecht, and we were able to lure her to Germany with the chance of visiting that store. Here we see these chips in the world on a packet of cream cheese and they were hidden under the barcode. At this was, we had the opportunity to get a guided tour of the store and we were given a three hour introduction to the metro crew and uh, we were being, getting explanations about how it all works and how justified the award was in 2003 we only noticed after our visit when we gave a talk in Bielefeld about our visit and in the interval showed how reading the RFID tag works in practice we had a reader and uh, of course we had been buying some goods in the supermarket so we were putting that on the scanner and, and saw how the numbers popped up and someone in the audience says hey what about the customer card no no we said no we just had a three-hour guided tour they didn't say anything about the customer card but why not try it so Bettina you have this card don't you why don't you just hand it over and we put it on the reader and you can see it live there. This was the actual event, and it says blip, and a number came up. 10,000 customers of that supermarket were walking with a bug like that in their pockets without ha having any idea about it. And we couldn't have staged it any better. This was happening live, a discovery, completely surprising. So the next day, we took that card to an X-ray practitioner and uh, were able to see the antennas in the card. And of course that led us to give a call to Metro and the press spokesperson said, oh, I have no time at all right now, I'll get back to you later. Now later was 5 p.m. and they were sending us photos at that time and telling us that the DVD shelf actually had, uh, had the hint or <laughs> the information that the chip was on a customer card. Well, never mind the fact that the DVD shelf is not the right place, because you should be told about this as you apply for the customer card. Even that was another lie. Here we see the photo that Metro sent us on Monday, the, the 2nd of February, and this was our own photo taken at our visit on the 31st of January, two days earlier, and there were a few signs less at the time. So all, we, all you could read there was that you could unlock the trailer or look at the trailer uh, for that movie. Now that we thought was a bit too much uh, deception, so we publicized this. 
and told Metro that we thought their future was getting out of control and told them to stop. Metro, of course, said, well, we don't care. So we called for a demo, and the Chaos Computer Club joined us pretty quickly, the Green Party's youth organization and other groups, and Metro were getting cold feet. One day before the demo, they sent us a fax telling us they would withdraw the card. Well, not because of any factual reasons, but because of the emotional atmosphere that had been created. But it, had, it was too late. The demo went ahead. The pictures went around the world. The first demo on this issue, uh, newspapers, including the Financial Times, were reporting, and that again had an effect on Metro's stock value, which fell and German TV attributed that decline in the stock market value to our action. So if we knew about speculation, we would have found a way to finance our association at the time. The RFIB lobby were playing hardball. They were threatening the press with injunctions and informal pressure like withdrawing ads was also applied and the, the, the press on RFID uh, were told to uninvite critical voices on RFID for discussion panels and the like. And uh, the TV program that, whose web page is shown there uh, um, was withdrawn by the TV channel, although the court case was actually won in, in the end. What we did then was to go to the CBIT trade fair in 2006 with a large floating banner. And we thought security would get us after five minutes. But then that would have, that would have produced some very unpleasant pictures. And we were able to walk around for quite a while and distribute leaflets until finally someone from the trade fair organizers got to us and told us to withdraw this banner because it was above the height admissible for ad banners in that hall. I can imagine how a legal person in the background was sitting there and, and, and leafing through the uh, regulations until he found some, some way of, of framing us. Then there was a survey by a consumer organization about attitudes toward RFID, and there are two interesting items in that. The first, in Germany, the percentage of people knowing what RFID was is highest in comparison. This is 26% only were saying they had never heard of RFID, the lowest percentage of all. And then on top there, there's 37% 30, of people saying that data protection is an important factor if they were to buy a product fitted with RFID. So data security, data, data protection regarded important in Germany. So we can say that that was good work from our part. The RFID Information Forum, which is a lobby organization by the industry, then started a competition, a design competition for an RFID logo. And this was, of course, to propose to the EU Commission, um, to be proposed to the Commission who was probably going to introduce a labeling obligation. This is the winner of the industry design competition. So we went ahead and made up a design competition of our own, and this was our winner. So it's, it's, the rollout then did not take place, but the issue isn't over yet. And uh, we have applications coming to the market now. This one won a new Big Brother Award in 2007, a fashion brand who sew RFID chips against product piracy into their jackets. And this is why they say on, on the patch that hides the RFID label, do not remove this label. 
Gary Weber, uh, another German fashion company, put the RFID chips into the textile care instruction labels, which uh, eases stock taking and also serves for securing against theft. These tags can be read across eight meters distance. If you consider that this data, well, it does belong to the product, but it can be related to a person. Uh, and if we consider that eight meter distance, we know that we have some work to do still. So, thank you. And we now switch over to Andreas Krisch. In the meantime, we can quickly announce that you can give us feedback and any sort of comments under the Twitter hashtag 28C3EN. 28C3EN, Twitter hashtag for any sort of feedback for the live interpretation. And now Andreas Kisch, but, uh, which is going to be spoken by me. So, yes, uh, Lina has already uh, explained uh, that uh, RFID technology has uh, arrived in the uh, society uh, quite loudly, and uh, about the time the Fürbud has um, uh, made it public with the Metro, and at the same time I have uh, started working in Vienna on the same topic, uh, questions like what, is the, what are the problems, what is the situation, and it's not just so, also saying it's not only Furbord and um, my organization in Austria and uh, together with, we also work together with Case Computer Club, other organizations, uh, 28 together in Europe from 18 countries, um, that's this European Digital Rights, so they're the, um, the organization that um, makes sure uh, that, that fights for data protection in Europe and uh, by this publicity through these actions. Um, so the, these, these actions made the clear for the European Commission that uh, there will be uh, there won't be RFID technology wi widespread uh, in Europe unless we don't work on the data protection. So that's why the European Commission uh, in 2009 uh, enacted an expert group that is uh, that uh, is working on RFID and data protection and invited some sort of uh, all, all some kinds of uh, labor unions and uh, industry organizations and data protection organizations and uh, public data protection organizations and uh, EDRI as well. Standardization bodies uh, also, and uh, us, Edwin. So one day we got an email from the European Commission if we don't want to send someone into this commission and of experts, and yes, that was a good idea for us, and we were prepared uh, content-wise, and we were competent enough to say something about this, so we accepted the offer and uh, entered the discussion process. That, uh, you can imagine that somehow like uh, gladiators, uh, gladiator fights don't happen in the arena but more at the table with very, very hard positions uh, on both sides. Um, the industry said, no, data protection will kill our industry. Data protection was saying, oh, this is going to kill uh, data, any sort of data protection in Europe and uh, privacy in Europe. And that was the, the original uh, positions. So, in the first uh, six months, we uh, basically spent our time with putting our arguments on the table and uh, every, each side for, with, with very good um, uh, statements and, uh, and, in, and uh, yeah, making sense for itself. And um, please take over. So, without data protection, we, we won't have data protection unless there will be measures. So, um, and this was related to this discussion about video surveillance, uh, uh, where it has been agreed that some signage has to be there. And uh, so we could foresee that something like this would be coming for RFID. The question was, how would it be? Um, and so the ball was being played between the RFID Information Forum and Philboard. This was 
perfect ich timing on Fribourg's part. Fribourg did this in Germany. The information forum is in Germany too. I was in Vienna and the, in the expert group at the EU Commission and we were watching this from a distance as it were. And one day we were sitting in Brussels at the Commission and we start to, to go through the papers and find these two logos in the papers from the EU Commission and the color change in the faces of the industry representatives was quite nice to observe. Both logos, one to one, uh, their logo next to Ferbold's one, it couldn't have been better. Uh, so to cut it short, the result was neither of these two logos will be used. The European standardization agreement um, groups are actually busy working on the logo right now. So neither this nor that will be the actual logo, but hopefully it will be a good one. The result of uh, that work at the expert group was that in 2009, uh, in the EU Commission uh, gave a recommendation about RFID. This is about the weakest uh, tool in their toolbox. Is, it is not legally binding. It is a proposition to member states uh, what should be taken care of in terms of RFID and uh, the industry to, to ensure data protection and security. Three important points there. The Commission says who uses RFID shall, before, it should, should make a privacy assessment beforehand to find out what the implications are to, to the privacy of the customers. Second item. Um, Retailers uh, must offer a, a way of deactivating the RFID tags at, at the checkout unless the privacy assessment first came to result that. So the deactivation selling um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, the assessment was also to uh, guarantee transparency and uh, it must be clear that the, it must be clear that what are reading devices and what uh, products are uh, labeled with RFIDs and there must also be infos and uh, about the the whole data protection and how can how people can get in, uh, information about it and uh, the, yeah the industry wasn't happy about it but it was a in in general it was a good compromise um, it was a good compromise for the data protection uh, activists and it wasn't it wasn't very much like we don't do very all data protection at all and it wasn't uh, full data protection, but we understood that this was a good compromise, and uh, the European Commission wants to evaluate this after three years, and then if it works, uh, everything's fine. If not, um, they will find uh, they will take harder measures. In next spring, the European Commission will evaluate the uh, the measures, and uh, if the yeah, we will be have to talk about. Um, the the measures and the implementation and as you can see the, so far there hasn't happened very much in terms of data protection so that you will the European Commission will have to take stronger measures. Um, so, uh, so, uh, um, the um, industry is required to implement the privacy impact assessment, which is a self-regulation process. Um, they will have to make sure that what they, what measures they are going to take in order to uh, secure privacy, and um, that's what they wrote. They wrote a paper with some text on it and thought they might just come through with that uh, with not implementing it but with just writing something down. But the European Commission, um, um, the European Commission required uh, that the uh, assessment is to be endorsed by the artic uh, Article 29 Working Party. Um, uh, but they said it is not uh, finished yet, and we want to give it back, and we want to don't want to approve this. And um, yeah, and the industry and the European Commission also said, yeah, okay, it's not that uh, well done through yet, and yeah. And uh, 2011, so the, the, the 
impact, the impact assessment was only finished in 2011 uh, after uh, yeah, going back and forth and uh, now it's quite okay and it uh, takes the European data protection law as a basic assessment and uh, makes uh, sure that this is the required are met and uh, um, sets known risks of RFID technology uh, in, in, in relation to that and makes propositions how the European data protection uh, law can be uh, can be fulfilled with these uh, with the RFID technology. This, um, this and yeah, the, the question is how uh, seriously this is uh, implemented, and um, that is uh, the question. You know, if 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 it if you don't take it seriously, that then it doesn't make any sense. If it, if you take it seriously, it can produce quite good um, um, uh, results and. Um, um, the classical thinking is that you are thinking of name, address, and shoe size, and things like that. Article 29 now says that on, at the basis of current EU legislation, uh, the data protection directive that we have, if a tag is carried by a person with a unique ID, and the tag is probably going to be worn by, by a person or carried by a person, then that number can be related to a person, and it's personal data. So it has to be protected just like any other personal data. The reason given for this is the fact that that number and the radio transmission that is not visible, at any time a data collection could be started on that. You need that idea and you can then track the person and using that idea you can uh, that ID you can find out what product it is and all the details of, of the product and so on. So from that point of view it's clear so the, if RFID is, RFID is automatically personal data and in that case it has to be deactivated at the point of sale or removed. So that was a huge success there, much more that we could, than we could expect, but of course now that has to be implemented correctly, which is why we're now very active to, to look at the industry and they might be saying, okay, we, we have found this great way out and we've made our impact assessments. We have to look at those assessments and, and see how have these assessments actually been done. Um, for example, that big chain that starts with M and ends with O. If they say they assessment had said uh, there was no impact on privacy uh, using the definition of personal data, you ask yourself how was that possible. So again, with the evaluation by the Commission, we have to get involved and, and get this topic going, make sure that exactly at this point the assessment quality is being ensured and we have to observe if things are really handled the way they say they are. So what happened since that recommendation 2009 is that the Commission has gone one step further. They've said RFID is very, we're all very well, um, but where does the whole journey go next? And that's the Internet of Things. So not just those silly RFID tags who radio their identity number and doesn't count anymore, but uh, autonomous data processing embedded into objects network sensor systems and things like that. So for that reason now we have a further expert group, the Internet of Things expert group, which has been founded last year with similar uh, so, For example, smart metering. So, yeah, what does Internet of Things mean? Exactly, smart metering, for example. Um, so, if our electricity and gas uh, meters and uh, start sending our usage data uh, and therefore information what happened in our flats, uh, send them all to the energy companies. Another, ca another example is intelligence transport systems where the transport and uh, 
uh, road transport uh, are networked with each other, um, where one vehicle tells it, uh, another one how the roads are, uh, what the roads look like, if there has been an accident before, what the weather looks like. All this communication between uh, individual vehicles is a uh, classical um, example for Internet of Things. So what does it mean? We have um, very strong automatized identification of objects that, um, as with RFID ID, can lead to the identification of uh, certain people and, of course, also the identification of certain behavioral patterns and uh, preferences and geographical positions of people and so on and so on. So we have the same traceability we have uh, the building of profiles. We have, of obviously, um, the, 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 the risk of that it, this data is used for other uh, purposes than, uh, than the intended one. And we have the rate risk that the combination of these, all these data can be used for additional, um, additional things and will make citizens very transparent if this is used on a wide range, um, especially when the uh, when the control remote controlling of buildings is also integrated in that etc so uh, we are in the situation where we are currently uh, have problems with uh, data protection uh, guidelines um, that is 15 years old um, and these pro problems will uh, be made will be enforced with um, these guidelines and the question is how we can make data protection fit for the Internet of Things and how we can proceed in our future with the current uh, data protection and how we can uh, strengthen this data protection. So how the, the also another question is how can we get data protection in these objects in the same manner as we first had cars without uh, a security belt and then we in had car makers in implement these security belts and uh, just that way we have to learn in this um, area how to build IT software applications and so on um, in a manner that uh, data protection is already, already integrated and not just in the, through some sort of uh, backing and uh, legal uh, obligations to pre prevent uh, abuse. So that's one of the technical problems. So, um, and that all we have to implement with objects that have very uh, scarce resources such as data capacity and uh, processing power and uh, it is enough to be harmful but we uh, still have to implement data protection in that. That is a hurdle we have to overcome. Uh, also and another question is uh, how can I be as a person for example, if we have room control by diverse factors, how do we get at the information that this is taking place? How can I ensure that things are not being done with my personal data that I don't want and that I would not agree to? And, uh, well, how can I be sure that the data protection principles, data minimization, uh, data being bound to specific use and all that are being ensured without actually being able to look into the actual application? And the problem is, called, of course, is that the various applications then have to work together as well. So that again leads us to the question, who in the end is going to be the operator? Of, th of the whole thing if applications communicate with each other and, and use information as they need in an autonomous way. So maybe there is no way of, of, uh, of knowing as one operator how the whole thing, the co cooperation works. So what do we want to achieve? We need for this 
opportunity to use the legal principles which are not that bad if we uh, just look at the principles without their application in practice. We have to get those applied here. We need more responsibilities of operators. When they need to have feel more responsibility for the IT that they actually put out into the world. And of course, we need law enforcement. We often see that uh, enforcement is actually lacking quite a bit. So for that, we need opportunities to, to put this into practice techn technologically. So the basic pillar is the people have to keep, being, keep control about what happens to their data. It has to be possible to uh, communicate this to people in a way that is understood even by people who are not experts in the Internet of Things, so that they can then decide competently whether they want to participate. And of course, we need a harmonization of data protection standards in general. Um, we have a very fragmented state of things right now, and we have to see how we get a more unified approach there. So this means we want that uh, there is a general application of privacy impact assessments. We want a catalogue of best practices and general, generally recognized risks have to be answered. We um, would like to see data protection embedded by design into applications and we need therefore a better harmonization, unification of uh, the law as it, is, as it is applied and enforced. This means we need to talk not just about needing privacy, privacy by design and about privacy by default being a good thing. We have to get, take that next step and, and then put these concepts into practice in the IT. This is the main point and this is mainly a technological challenge, but of course it's also a challenge on the concept level and we need in solche Dinge zu investieren, dann, dann wird es in den meisten and Fällen nicht stattfinden. Und insofern we need incentives for investments into these concepts. And this, of course, das heißt, the financial matter is, of course, an important aspect. So we need a strengthening of data protection supervisory authorities. We need stronger sanctions against violations. We need obligations for operators to inform about data protection violations and, and it would be quite sensible from our point of view that data protection commissioners should be introduced blanket, uh, on, on a blanket level. And, uh, this happens in Germany, but we haven't got that all over Europe right now. Also, there we need a set of legal uh, clarifications. So when is this regulation um, really valid and when uh, um, I when how, when can I say, okay, I'm inform informed yeah, well, properly and I want to take up this risk? So um, let's talk uh, about the data protection reform uh, during the question and answers, and then we can uh, look at the current leaked plans from the European Commission and uh, how, they how they think about data protection in Europe in the future. So my question, applause for Andreas Krisch um, to Andrea Tangens. Round of applause. We have now about 13 minutes for Q&A, and I would like to ask all attendees to stay until the until the end because the unrest in the in the room is bad for the atmosphere. We have also a signal at Angel who will take up questions from the IRC channel. And yeah, my first question would be to the to the uh, attendees uh, who has any questions. So first question is that we can't say 
uh, how, what, um, what uh, devices um, collect data about us. It can be the TV that uh, collects the data about what we watch, and it can be every other device that uh, collects just collects data and sends it somewhere. So it would be the question whether we can regulate that the that the, the interface uh, has to open source uh, the, uh, has been open sourced. So uh, by every uh, device that uh, is uh, collects and transmits data, so we can see that uh, the, what happened. There. So all the source has to be transferred to the European Commission in order for the public to see what happens with our tools. And then the question would be if this open source tool can not only be used by the users, but also experts uh, who can have a look at the open source, uh, open source uh, interfaces, for example, from Sony and Apple, that would be publicized. And then that would, yeah, that should be uh, uh, opportunity that every um, manufacturer should uh, accept, and then we can all see what happens with our data. Well, in major parts, uh, I think from the point of view of enforcement, um, to get everything open source, I think, will not, not be possible. Uh, the important thing will be open standards. Uh, standardization uh, is, of course, something that the Commission is going to organize and will have to achieve uh, this to be all open and there is going to have to be unified regulations. Uh, next to data protection, the EU Commission, of course, cares about e-governance or governance. Uh, the uh, option that the Internet of Things should not get into, into the same constellation or situation that we have it with ICANN at the moment, uh, where Europe does not have the influence it would like to have. So this is one of the interests of the Commission uh, to be in the driver's seat in that respect and, and lead the way. Um, the, the Japanese are fairly well advanced and there is a cooperation with them, but basically the principle is open standards are key and uh, one of the points in the proposal, that the, the upcoming proposal by the EU Commission about data protection law would be uh, the right to data port portability. Um, if you, there should be interfaces between data and then should be interoperable formats should be standardized. So and it's also important for me that uh, it's not only open but also produced uh, by certain standards and that means that privacy by default is a serious design criteria and that during developing the technology people have to think about if this uh, feature has is needed and if not so we had a discussion with someone um, here uh, about the controlling of public transport uh, and uh, individual transport and if I want to if he, if he wanted to use um, if how could this work if you wanted to travel through Germany with one RFID card uh, and public transport and uh, how the data the, how the data is uh, transferred and that this couldn't be prevented and I'm convinced that it could be prevented that not too many data is uh, produced and I am uh, convinced that privacy by design, if we uh, implement that as one design principle, we can uh, make sure that um, it makes sense and it makes usable and I think we can should use our cr technical creativity to find solutions that are usable for all. And uh, the other uh, other task we have is to make public um, 
pressure so that every, all that happens. So all the privacy assessment thing is uh, handled as a risk, and our work. Um, I, th I see our work as a risk factor for companies, and if we create enough risk for these companies, something will move, and some and the design will change. And we have to do this now because the development needs time. And if when we uh, um, yeah, if we already have this in all the all the devices we carry in our pockets and on uh, with us. Um, then we can't do very many things about it, and then we need uh, uh, lawful uh, regulation and uh, and yes, uh, take over. Of course, data protection is, a, is not a very new idea. Uh, my question is simply, is, does this have a role at the moment uh, when the EU thinks about reforms? Uh, of course, uh, data protection rules always are a step behind the technology that gets more and more complicated and it's not easy to put that into legalese. The second question, Internet of Things, uh, of course, it's more than RFID. The problem I see mainly in the link between the personal relatable data. Um, I've always said that I don't much care whether the products at Metro are being tagged. The problem is if they can be related to a person. So what's the development, development at the moment in connection related to, to RFID and personal or person related? Data. Uh, can we say that we can uh, unlink it from the personal relation? Um, the problem, of course, is that RFID is getting into personal, into passports as well. Now, uh, so is the trend towards personal data or is the trend towards logistics, as the proponents always say, uh, make it easy to follow? Uh, products in the store and, and which would make it, which would make it uh, pointless to, to think about data protection. So, of course, if I walk an RFID chip through the streets, this is another matter. So, uh, so what's, uh, what are the trends? Yes, so. Uh, for, to the second part first, um, it is for 10 years it has, we have talked about the intelligent uh, fridge and the intelligent washing machine and I haven't seen them personally and I was told that there's somewhere, there was one in some laboratory. Um, there is until today no single business model that uh, uh, that um, you, uh, realistically explains uh, uh, our usage of RFID after sale. So uh, there makes there are so very many business models that make sense until to the say uh, until the until the cash desk, um, for example, security and all these other things. But there is no business plan that uh, integrates the usage of RFID tags after sale. So it's not only about um, laziness, but it's also about um, the usage in the market. So if no one is using the RFID tags, it's difficult to build a business plan upon that. But uh, if the, everybody uses them already, then it would make sense. So um, if I yeah, if the, for example, if I could say I will switch on this RFID for this uh, single application, then that would make sense. But uh, until then, it is um, yeah, it, it, there, there is no single business model. And concerning data protection reform, uh, the trend is surely to increase responsibility on the side of the operators. Uh, sanctions seem to. Uh, there is thought about raising sanctions uh, significantly until certain, up to a certain percentage of people, uh, companies' turnover. So, um, regarding sanctions, there are approaches how it should be done, and the companies are being obliged much more and, and have to demonstrate that they take their obligations seriously, and uh, supervising authorities are strengthened as well. 
so all three pillars of this equation are being addressed and strengthened. But this is the very first draft which has to go through the whole negotiation process and only at the very end of it, which will be at two years at the earliest, we'll really know what's going to happen. The draft is actually has been leaked to State Watch and there will be links on the page about the talk. Do we need the data protection rules from the 80s um, uh, to, to actually regulate uh, inventions from today? And the answer is, well, I don't think we need these, all these uh, 90s post-privacy ideas either. Well, every single one of us Will have the, must have the choice, or has the choice, whether they want their data completely out in the open, or whether he or she has any aspects that they don't want to share. And exactly this choice what is what it's all about, and we cannot, cannot give up that choice. The next question is if there are currently available on the market, uh, some, any examples available on the market for something like privacy by design, or uh, are there any, aren't there any, and do we need, how can we uh, generate incentive, inter incentives, incentives with the manufacturers? Well, the, that term is quite heavily used at the moment. Uh, there is all kinds of technology that is privacy friendly and integrates data protection without you having to display that in large letters. Uh, you can, for example, look at the products that do receive data protection uh, certificates. Uh, there's the European Privacy Seal, for example. These are given out for products that are particularly good in terms of data protection, uh, not just fulfilling the legal framework, but going beyond that. So that would be uh, privacy by design. If you hear some applause, this is from room one. We're sitting above room one. I wanted to add for this uh, sorry that you have to have the choice. That is it very important that I don't want to be uh, suspicious, uh, considered suspicious only because I don't want to public make make these data public. Um, the, the series How Met Your Mother had exactly that theme. So, um, so um, they, they arranged a date and said, how about we don't Google each other? And um, that, uh, yeah, um, yeah, and what the other person said, well, that makes you suspicious. And he said, no, no, I don't have anything to hide. But uh, um, how, how, why do I make myself suspicious only that because I don't want people to see my data? And that uh, has to... Um, yeah, it has to be possible technically and as well as socially that people don't want to be Googled this is why or I'm found. That it's very important to strengthen supervisory authorities. In Europe, we have the situation that uh, in practically no countries, two countries, we have the same standards. The European uh, Basic Law Agency has conducted a study which came to the result that uh, most privacy supervisory authorities are not using their powers to the full because the laws aren't fully in, pla in, in place. So we have a complete, deep, completely different approaches to data protection. Germany kind of is, is the shining example. Uh, other countries are not as good but improving. The point is absolutely, it's not whether I have something to hide but whether others should know. I wanted to add yeah, that we may uh, just add some uh, questions when we finish the talk. I have a point that um, goes in the same direction. Um, the, so yeah, there's there's two th two aspects that are currently undermining this uh, effort. One is the social, and one is the economic uh, pressure. So um, uh, there's one point that I have to undertake uh, economic um, problems just because I don't want to uh, you want to have. Um, uh, 
uh, my data use. So uh, if I, uh, sorry, you have to take, I just got a block, and I wasn't quite following either. This is a difficult question. If you have a season ticket uh, in public transport, uh, uh, do you still have the choice? Uh, uh, answer well there's 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 one item here the coupling prohibition uh, using a service must not depend on you giving up your data uh, uh, mostly giving up your data is just about paying and if there is another way of ensuring that uh, the service is getting paid for there is no need to actually register all the data, especially when ticketing for public transport is concerned. There is a concept that makes this possible anonymously, nationwide, which would make it possible to use public transport across the country without giving up your identity and without getting tracked. But uh, this is now on us as customers uh, to demand this, because otherwise we're just here, well, customers want this, uh, customers want the comfort and, and it's all working as it is. So we need to get the, con the conscientiousness or the, uh, the knowledge going that uh, these things can be set up. And in one way, we have this in the recommendation by the Commission about RFID data protection, because it explicitly states that consumers uh, shall not have disadvantages if they insist on RFID, RFID getting it deactivated. So coupling uh, extra services to that, to RFID tax being still in use, uh, is not allowed. This is not legally binding yet, but it's in the recommendation, and, and, and we have the first step towards this into the right direction. One last question via ICRC. Are there already ideas for counteractions in sort of yeah, in terms of like let's walk past uh, some sort of truck with uh, RFIDs with a microwave. There are currently car no plan protests against RFID or Internet of Things apart from those that exist. I want to say some one thing. Um, the introduction um, that Rena did, um, I am very much convinced that the, the whole discussion on the EU level between the experts and the European Commission wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been the, the resistance against this technology in Germany. I am very sure that this has been one of the most important points that this has taken this direction and uh, therefore I am very sure that we have to stay active and uh, recognizable and also recognizable, uh, articulate recognizable if there are things happen that we don't like. This, this story about the RFID chips in the customer card in, uh, that we discovered uh, we actually forced Metro to withdraw the cards. We would not have dreamed about being able to do that. This was actually our enlightening moment, our uh, realization that we can actually achieve something. We had about 60 members at the time, and Metro is the third largest retailing company worldwide. So if we do something at the right point, we can actually achieve something. And that we can do with giving out information, with using creative intelligence, and uh, we can, of course, Use it, do that with using with the work and on the European level as well. If everyone else uh, start putting the pressure on and their favorite places, we can actually see something. So, thank you very much also for listening. If anybody listened, you can uh, give us feedback under the hashtag 28C3. I'm Julian. This is Sebastian. Yes, I'm Sebastian. And this was a very difficult talk to translate. Very quick speaking, very Yeah, and this is very fast. <laughs> but we are going to continue right. tomorrow. And you can contact me on Twitter under uh, the handle HDSJulian, or you can write under the hashtag 28C3EN and give us feedback or tell us if you want to join. We're still looking for additional people because translating more than an hour with two people is very, very hard. Oh, 
audience. And we're looking for yeah, uh, people who want to try who are good in English and understand German. And there will also be updates on the blog at events.ccc.de about locations and outputs. Exactly. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening. Give us a note if you did. We're not sure if this was even listened by one person, but we were, had fun by, you know, it was the first day we, exactly. we were trying and we are learning and uh, thanks for listening anyway. Bye-bye.